Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Pat. And uh, thank you for uh, staying with us during our pause in, in August. We had, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on. Everybody's out doing summer stuff, and beautiful weather and whatnot. So uh, we just, and I was on vacation for uh, a couple of weeks and Kat was out sailing and we were all doing crazy stuff. So we needed to take a pause <laughs> <laughs> for a little bit. Um, so we're glad that you're back. We're happy to be back too. Um, and so we're going to be starting off our uh, marine mammal highlight, as we normally do at the beginning of the month. Um, this one was a very close race. Uh, it was mm. between the pilot whale and the melon-headed whale. Um, and it, I don't think we've had a closer one. It was one vote off. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. It was like, yeah, it was, there was only one. Whoever was the last person who voted for pilot whale, you won it for them. Woo <laughs> um, so we're doing the pilot whale. Now, there are two different types of pilot whales. There are long fin pilot whales and short fin fin pilot whales. And we were gonna attempt to kind of do them together, but they there there's a lot of similarities, but then there's a few differences, and so we just thought it'd be much cleaner if we just did one of them. So we very scientifically randomly chose the long fin pilot whale. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, because 50 50. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there you go. Um, so we're doing the long fin pilot whale today. And there's lots of cool stuff about these guys. They're actually, I think they're very interesting because they are so social. And I'm kind of a social mm -hmm. structure person. So much of uh, that was, was very interesting to me. Um, and so with that, we will no further ado. And we will start off with Kat, who will tell us what they look like with their cute little square heads and uh where they are mm -hmm. yeah so like cindy said before we get into appearance and distribution um i will say that every source i found um does note that it's very difficult to distinguish these two species in the wild there are differences in their appearance but they're fairly slight when you're seeing them from a distance so just bear that in mind as we go through well, especially because um, the, the big main difference in their name is long and short fin pilot whales and their fins are under the water. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So. so like Cindy said, we're going to focus on the long fin pilot whale today. So these guys are what, what I would say is like a medium sized whale. They typically grow up to about 25 feet and 5,000 pounds for males, about 20 feet and 2,900 pounds for females. Um, so the males are slightly bigger. Um, Quick fun fact, right at the top of the episode here, Ooh. biggest long fin pilot whale male will weigh three tons. <gasps> three tons, good. Can you imagine seeing that guy oh. in the wild? Oh That's my God. Like Hercules, Hercules, yeah. Hercules. <laughs> um, but as a rule, they are a pretty stocky and robust uh, species. So they have this kind of like fairly chunky body. Um, like Cindy said, they have a very large bulbous sort of squarish forehead. It's, it's quite square. Where, which houses their melon, which is what they use to echolocate and, and receive um, the echoes of that back again. Mm -hmm. um, this also varies with age and sex, which I thought was interesting. Um, so the melon and the size of the head changes with age and sex a little bit. Interesting. Well, I guess like, it makes sense because like with dorsal mm -hmm. fins with orcas, those change based on age and sex of the individual. So they just decided to do yeah. it on their foreheads instead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they are dark black in color, sometimes appearing darker gray or brownish. Um, the calves are lighter in color, and so they get darker as they, as they age. Um, they're not uniformly dark, however. They do have paler um, markings. Um, some of the examples given were like a diagonal eye stripe or a blaze that extending from the eye and up towards the dorsal fin. Um, they do also have a saddle behind the dorsal fin and an anchor shaped patch at the throat that extends down to their underside. Which if I you saw see, that on their on on one of the pictures, they put their head up like that, and it's very striking. It's really pretty, actually. Yeah. Um, so they're not just uniformly dark. They do have these kind of variations in color. Um, the dorsal fin, it's funny that you mentioned that. So the dorsal fin is also a fairly thick dorsal fin. 
uh, about a third of the body length behind the head. And similar to orcas, as they get older, the dorsal fin becomes broader and rounder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before we go any further with their appearance, the long, both pilot whale species are considered part of the blackfish grouping, which is basically a grouping of animals. It's sort of a, it is technically a scientific grouping, but it's, it's not a species based grouping necessarily, but there's um, false killer whales, killer whales, long and short fin pilot whales, melon headed whales are all considered part of this blackfish grouping. So they do have some of these things in common, um, which I just think is really interesting. Yeah. And I mean, they're all like, if you put like a basic picture of a, of like a dark whale with kind of a square head and those kind of, like, they all kind of look like that, just variations on that theme. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. So again, you can get an idea of like why it might be tough to tell some of these apart when you're in the field and they're maybe just doing a quick surfacing. You're not sure what you're looking at. Um, so like I said, robust body, squarish head, you know, pretty, pretty normal sized dorsal fin for an animal of that size. Um, as Cindy mentioned at the top, their name partly comes from these long tapered fl uh, flippers on either side of their body, but also from the belief pilot wheel pilot whales in general, that name it's thought comes from the belief that the pod follows a single leader, which I'm sure we'll get into in the behavior, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of their teeth, they have uh, 16 to 26 peg-like teeth. I thought that was a very interesting description. So um, you mean 16 to 26? That's what I found on the NOAA website. Yeah. Interesting. In e that was in, in each jaw, in each jaw. Oh, so that would be- Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes he sense. Didn't, didn't let me finish there. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, wait, that's you know, like that's like half of what I found. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Um, so this is thought it might be an evolutionary adaptation, and Cindy will get into that in the diet section as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of what they look like. In terms of their distribution, they are pretty widely distributed between cold and temperate waters. Um, they do prefer the deeper temperate to subpolar oceanic waters, but have been known to occur in coastal areas as well in specific locations. Um, there are three distinct populations or potentially even subspecies of long fin pilot whales. There's the Southern Hemisphere grouping, the North Atlantic grouping, and then according to the NOAA website, this was an, an unnamed extinct form in the Western North Pacific. Oh. Interesting. Which is curious. I didn't find any more information about that, but apparently that's, <laughs> like that, con that's considered. That. Yeah, apparently that was considered a separate grouping, which is interesting. Well, if they're on the other side, yeah, if they're in a different ocean, that usually mm -hmm. usually makes sense. Long. Right. So, so we, have the, the southern, we have the North Atlantic and Southern Atlantic, basically. That are, uh, southern Hemisphere. So the Southern Hemispheres go over to the Pacific side? Potentially. Oh, interesting. So let me tell you. So Bye. Southern Hemisphere... They are typically in the 19 degrees south to 60 degrees south range, um, have been regularly sighted in the Antarctic Convergence Zone, um, and in the Central and South Pacific as far south as 60 degrees south. Mm -hmm. So in terms of specific locations, um, their range includes parts of South Africa, Chile, Southern Australia, New Zealand, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, which I thought mm -hmm. was very interesting and specific. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they've also been documented near the Antarctic. So in that sort of sea ice range um, associated with the colder uh, currents down there, which they did state might extend their typical range. Um, so I think just again, because we're not down there as frequently to know if they are often found down there, if they just right. happen to go down there occasionally, um, and as well as the Falkland Islands, Falkland Islands down there as well. Um, so again, pretty wide distribution around the Southern Hemisphere. Um, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then in the North Atlantic, um, their range includes the U.S. East Coast, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Azores, Madeira, North Africa, the Western Mediterranean Sea, the North Sea, Greenland, and the Barents Sea. So mm -hmm. again, very widely distributed very wide. within the North Atlantic. Especially compared to, I think, the short fin pilot whales, which we'll, we'll go in another one, but that's a very, very distinct difference. In right. And that was that was where I was like, you know, I think actually let's just keep them separate because there's yeah. enough differences that it would be really confusing to, to try to do both. So mm -hmm. basically, they're pretty widespread in the locations that they are found. Mm -hmm. um, it does say in the in the north hem northern hemisphere, they typically are more in the offshore oceanic waters during the winter and spring. 
um, in the summer and fall, they're typically found uh, more farther inshore and on the continental shelf. So again, as you'll talk about, they're mostly following the food here. Mm -hmm. um, so their specific seasonal movements do often depend on just where the food sources are that they're taking advantage of. And hmm. uh, I find it interesting that the the North Pacific side would have been a, a you know extinct separate subspecies, but there's no two subspecies down in the southern hemisphere. Like they're all connected, but these guys up here are not. I'm assuming that's because they're considered an extinct form. So presumably if that is now no longer there, well, they would have they're assuming different. that there would have, right there, there's a separation happening there that they no longer are coming into that area. But it's a, it's a good question, right? I mean, I mean is, is it, who knows why? I mean, geography is not my forte, but like, is it easier to go around the waters in the Southern hemisphere than it is the Northern hemisphere, right? Is there geographic blocks that are harder to, to navigate that would, necessitate them yeah. you know not being connected as much possibly yeah good question who knows not me don't ask me do you like <laughs> <laughs> but that's what Very i have cool. for their appearance and distribution okay well um and we'll have a picture of them of course if you're watching this you'll, you'll, you'll have it here uh, but if you're listening to it um please you know go to our youtube channel and and see the pictures or look them up yourself the, their heads are just it's very, it's very striking. It's yeah, very, very square. So cute. You're like, that doesn't seem like normal, natural, like square. Weird. <laughs> That's very cool. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do some diet and behavior. Uh, and so basically, so we'll go with the tea thing um to start off with for their food. Uh so the, yeah, they have um 40 to 48 teeth total. So it's basically double what cat said because it's one in each jaw. Um, they mainly eat cephalopods, that's their favorite, but they will also eat fish like cod, dogfish, hake, herring, mackerel, and turbot, which I thought was a fun name of a fish, um, and sometimes crustaceans like shrimp. Uh, but mm. what's interesting, the evolutionary um, thing that Kat uh, alluded to is that they have fewer teeth than most other dolphin species. So it is important to remember that these are part of the Delphinidae family. They are the second largest, right? Orcas are the largest in the Delphinidae family, and these guys are the second largest. But compared to other animal, other uh, cetaceans and like dolphins that prefer fish, they have much fewer teeth. So they have 40 to 48 versus dolphins that have r around like 120 on average. Mm, wow. So, so like less than half. Yeah. Like it really, wow. so they're definitely not ripping. They're, they're just, they're grasping. And, um, and actually what they're doing is ramming them and sucking them into their mouths. <laughs> it's called a ram and Yikes. suck. Yeah. Ram and suck. Um, <laughs> way to eat. <laughs> oh, that's, I feel like that could be very applicable to some toddlers. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just imagining a little kid, like how they eat sometimes. I'm like, I can, yep, yep. I could see that. All right. Using the, using the long fin pilot wheel strategy. I see what you're doing there. <laughs> That's right. Now I'm just going to see my little toddler running around like, a <laughs> so laugh. um, but so that, so they, they, they use that, the suck into their mouths and that's typical of other animals that eat squid. So think of a sperm whale. They have like mm. just a couple teeth. And they, they just use it to, you know, grab it and then suck it in. So, um, and like narwhals and belugas and stuff like that, who also do a similar thing, don't really have any teeth. So that seems to be kind of an evolutionary trend. The fewer teeth you have, the more sucking you do, apparently. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so they they feed pretty deep. These guys can, can, deep, can dive uh, a fair ways down. They can dive up to about 2,000 feet and hold their breath for about 10 to 16 minutes um, for their diving. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, their uh, diving behavior in, um, I think, the, the new research that I have. But uh, for the most part, they're diving down, and it makes sense that they're going down for squid and things like that. Those are kind of more uh, deeper, um, a lot of those are deeper species. Um, they mostly feed at night as well, uh, and in deeper water, usually between 650 and 16, uh, 650 and 1,650 feet. So. They're, they do some shallow dives, but um, I think their main main prey um, are down there in the deeper waters. Um, they had, I did find one uh, recent study, uh, and this is gonna sneak in here for new research, but uh, it has to do with diet, so I figured I'd put it here. Uh, but they were looking at, at uh, Tasmania, the animals around Tasmania in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, and so they found that there were 17 different families of cephalopods that these animals ate. Um, mm -hmm. 
they looked at stranding. This is a stomach contents um, for strandings. And I'm sure we'll get into, uh, and Kat will talk a lot about strandings and why they happen uh, in so many of them. Um, but the there were significant differences in diet among the four stranding locations. So mm -hmm. in some places, there were greater than um, 10 species that dominated the uh, the their diet. And in other areas, it was three or less. Wow. So all, all of them, yeah, all of them being cephalopods domination, domination, but how many different species they ate um, were different. Hmm. So, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of that is probably what's around those areas too, right? So depending on where they are, is you're going to necessitate whichever ones you're able to get. Uh, and some of those are going to be more diverse. Right. So uh, that's it about their diet, pretty much. That's they eat cephalopods and they ram and suck them. <laughs> the key points there. Um, so then uh, for behavior, so this is, and we'll I'll talk more about this in the new research as well, but long the pilot whales, as the, the name denoted, as Kat mentioned, was thought because they um, followed one leader. So the pilot of the group is the one that's leading this entire group. Now, we do know that that's not actually true, um, but their behavior still is interesting. It, it kind of goes along with that. that they're, <laughs> seems like they're following one person, um, whether they're following or one animal, um, uh, whether they're following just one or more, uh, the same behavior kind of happens. They are very, very social animals, very tight social groups. Um, more so than many other species that we have and will talk about. Um, almost similar to uh, the resident killer whales in terms of how they live their lives within their pods. So these guys have very tight social subgroups, um, usually with more females than males. Uh, about 10 to 20 is average. And these are built on mothers and their offspring. So they are a matrilineal society, similar to to the um, killer whales. And they do everything together. They rest, they hunt, they socialize, they play, they travel as a pod. And I, again, I'll get into that with the new research of the level to that of which they do. Hmm. Um, but what's interesting is, is like the resident killer whales and unlike most other, any other mammal in the world, they stay in that pod for life. So the males and females stay within their natal or birth pod um, for their entire lives. And that is very, very rare. So, um, but what's interesting is that the, so the, the one thing with that, the males stay, the issue is how are they making babies with thing, other animals they aren't related to? <laughs> it's a very important evolutionary struggle. So it does show that genetics has shown that the males in the groups are not the fathers of the babies that are there. Um, but several calves in one group may be fathered by the same male. So it seems like a male can come in and come in for a little bit and mate with more than one female and then be on his merry way. And this may happen when you see these, there are uh, sometimes seen loose groups of up to several hundred or even a thousand um, mm -hmm. observed. Kind of like the super pods um, it, uh, with the resident orcas up here, right? All, all the clans get together and they have a big old party and that's probably when some genetic mixing happens. <laughs> You're like, hey, here's my females. I'm gonna meet your females. We're gonna have a good time. And then we're gonna go back on the merry way. So um, they are, uh, again, I, I'm more so than many other cetacean species that have kind of a fission fusion where they're going in and out of groups and changing, um, having some long-term relationships, but changing others from a day-to-day -day basis. These guys do not, they hang out all together and really do everything as, as a group, including, stranding which I, we will talk about later but this is that's why we see these mass strandings because they are they just they stick together that's the, basically the, the end point um, and we'll talk more about that later um they do associate with a variety of other dolphin and whale species it's not uncommon to see them hanging out and sometimes even sharks apparently which oh. i didn't get much more than that from <laughs> they just mentioned that huh. and I was like that's cool what can I, hear I have more? so many questions about that I know like <laughs> would you be hanging out with shark I like what know. species of shark are you I hanging do. out with I don't know certainly not like, uh, uh was it I said they eat dogfish right yeah so certainly not dogfish because you know they're eating but yeah I don't know um I would like some information about that but was not able to find any moment. yeah okay um, but they're very social outside of themselves yeah um so as with social animals, the uh, uh, behaviors that you'll see that we 
talked about with other social animals and social um, dolphins, spy hopping. So that's where you get to see those cool coloration and their big heads coming out. They like to spy hop. They'll lift their flukes out and either tail slap or lob tail doing like a cartwheel, um, very common. Um, they have, this is one of my favorite things. They also will rest or log, right? So we talked about logging before where they just sit at the surface and look like logs, hence the term. Um, but they rest or log in a chorus line or stacked formation. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I was like, chorus line? That's funny. So now I just see them like, if they bob their tails out of the water, they're like doing like, you know, the can-can. From- oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Good chorus line. There you go. Um, but they're all just, you know, again, hanging out together. And a lot, a lot of that probably is an evolutionary thing for protection. And, you know, hanging out in groups is helpful for that. Um, but they will also sometimes approach vessels moving at slow speeds. So um, whale watching vessels sometimes will get some good looks at these animals. Um, and they're just curious, right? So... Um, and which is interesting based on how they've been hunted, right? And cat will get into that, but like, why would you be approaching vessels with the past that has happened? So um, kind of interesting that they uh, still still are curious even after mm-hmm. what's happened to them. Um, so uh, lastly, reproduction. Um, males uh, become sexually mature at about 12 to 13 years of age, females at eight. Um, males do compete for females by fighting, which is, uh, and often display aggressive behavior, uh, even with the females. Uh, and that's to be expected too, if you have a larger males and females, fighting is usually the avenue for how they get their females. Um, they breed from April to September in the Western North Atlantic and between October and April in the Southern Hemisphere, because the seasons are backwards. Uh, they have one calf every three to six years, and this is, they said, is one of the longest interbirth intervals of any cetacean, so um, um, pretty long. They're usually, it's like two to three years is probably average. Uh, gestation is around 12 months, but I've seen up to 16 months, but a lot of this was combined short fin and long fin pilot whales, and I know the short fin had longer, so it's somewhere between there, but I think closer to the 12-month mark. Um, and they will nurse anywhere from a, a year and a half to four years. Um, and uh, what's really interesting is that the last calf that they have, they may nurse that calf for like up to 10 years. Like if they have a male, they may nurse it until, no way. He, until he goes to puberty. Yeah. <laughs> They're really wow. Calf. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and it, I think maybe the only reason they stop nursing is because they have another baby. So then when you don't have another baby, you're like, what? <laughs> That's gotta be so costly though. Right. Exactly. I mean, lactation is huge. I mean, and they're not maybe, you know, they're getting little squirts. They're not, you know, it's not their main meal. So it's not quite as mm-hmm. energetically costly to the female as when they're young, but still, yeah, you're still having to make it it's expensive. So question about that. Is that more to do with the social bonding aspect then, do we think like to, to, to continue and like reinforce those social bonds than it is a nutritional or energetic that would make sense. I mean, I don't really think they're getting, it's not like the ones that get nursed for 10 years are doing way better than the other ones that didn't. You know, I don't think there's, yeah. I don't know if we know if there's a difference, but I doubt there is. So it's likely more of that kind of like a grooming or it just reinforces social bonds and okay. there's no reason to stop. So they don't. Right. <laughs> wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, they remain fertile, the females up to 35 to 40 years of age. Um, and they may only live to about 60 for females. So they're, you know, up there in age. Uh, and, but the older non-reproductive females will help care for calves, um, very similar to the, um, orcas. Um, and they can care and even nurse for other females calves for up to 15 to 20 years after they stop reproducing themselves. Wow. They had a female that was 51 that was still nursing, Hmm. which is crazy. Interesting. Um, and lifespan, uh, since I already mentioned the lifespan, males are shorter, so 35 to 45 years, but that's kind of pretty common. Um, males are just so much more feisty, get in trouble. Um, so yeah, they're really interesting in, the, in that social aspect that they really have that really tight knit community. And that means you have these other behaviors that are, are very different than other, other species because of that. So, yeah. Pretty cool. So that's what I have for our behavior and diet. So we're going to take a break and we'll come back and find out why they strand so much and all the bad things that have happened to them and then talk about some um, cool new research that's been done. After we take a quick break, we'll be right back.
All right, we're back. So Kat, tell us the sad story. Yay, <laughs> your favorite part. Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, let's talk about status. So these guys, like most other animals in the ocean that are um, that we've talked about, they are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the CITES II appendix throughout their range. In terms of actually population size, tricky. So what I found was that there's an estimated 1 million long fin pilot whales worldwide, but as with many of the other species that we've talked about, the exact population counts are lacking. Um, one NOAA stock assessment that I found, the most recent one that we have for the, at least the, the US uh, North Atlantic population is around about 39,000. That's I believe from 2018 data. Um, but long story short, we don't have a good handle on exact population numbers for these guys. Um, and especially because they are so widespread, that might be part of the problem. Yeah, I know. In one of my uh, papers, the they said that the, the ones around New Zealand, like, like they don't really know a lot about the population down there. So I'm sure there's some that we know what the population numbers are and other ones we don't. So it makes that whole total difficult. Yeah. And again, when you're when you're having to research and look across such a wide range too, it's hard to know. It, it's just tricky to actually get a good handle on numbers there. Um, so one problem with having a really widespread range. Yeah. So we're, we're estimating around about a million-ish um, worldwide. In terms of threats, um, let's start with uh, whaling. So historically, like Cindy mentioned, they were um, targeted as a species that whalers would hunt. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, their social aspect would work against them. So the whalers knew this about this species, and they would actually herd them together, um, kind of playing off of those strong social bonds, knowing that that would keep them all together in a, in a tight group, and then they could just pick them off. Um, so they were, they were predominantly targeted in the 19th and 20th centuries for things like their meat, their blubber, bones, and oil. Um, Drive fisheries, species, drive fisheries for them also occurred historically in the Falkland Islands, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Scotland, and um, parts of the Eastern US. Currently, they are still hunted um, at, on shore in the Faroe Islands. Um, there is a, a pretty well-known at this point, well-known hunt that still occurs in the Faroe Islands for longfin pilot whale. And again, for all of those same things, meat, blubber, bones, and oil. Um, so while this was a historical thing, unlike a lot of species we talk about, this is actually still ongoing in certain parts of the world. And just, um, to, just to reference that when she, when Kat said drive fishery, that basically means that they're, they're, they're specifically going for that species rather than being bycatch, right? So they're, they're yes. driving those animals into a thing for that specific purpose. Yes. Thank you. Good clarity. Um, speaking of bycatch, next <laughs> up we have entanglement. Perfect segue. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, these guys can become tangled in fishing gear, either getting caught in the nets or actually being hooked by, by gear as well. Um, they are particularly susceptible to gill nets, long lines, and trawlers. Um, again, like the other who are prone to bycatch, these dangers include direct issues of injury or death from um, the bycatch or indirectly by being fatigued, getting tangled up in gear, getting fatigued, um, lack of foraging ability, it can impair their reproductive ability. So it, it can have a short or long-term impact on them as well. And in terms they, they of will, they will other threats, won't they? They'll, they'll, they will take uh, like off of long lines and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. So uh -huh. Yeah. Another reason why they can get yeah. caught because they will eventually try to take fish. Yeah, yeah, they interact with fisheries quite a bit, actually, and especially I think in like parts of Europe where they have pretty big fisheries for things like squid and cephalopods, it can be a particular issue. Yeah, exactly. Um, another issue, disease. Um, so morbili virus has been found in pilot whales in the North Atlantic, but might even be native to specific areas. So I'm going to quote directly from the NOAA website here. Um, and they said that the historical prevalence of morbili virus in the blood of these whales suggests that they may have increased contact with the virus, but that the increased exposure means that enough of the population is likely immune to the virus to prevent serious outbreaks of infectious disease from occurring in, in parts of the Western Atlantic. So I don't think that's necessarily true of all groups of, pi of long film pilot whales, but these ones in the North Atlantic specifically seem to have some level of immunity to it. 
which is fascinating. Well, I'm going to quote the Princess Bride here. And he says that, so I've I've built up a resistance to iocane powder. <laughs> Slowly taking little sips of iocane powder for years and you have resistance to it. So that's interesting that they mm-hmm. are able to do it. I mean, it's a good thing to do if you can, if it's going to be around, like if you can be build up that resistancy. Res- that's not a word. Resistance. <laughs> resistancy. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, really interesting. Um, and again, you know, these these animals are interacting with you know they are coming closer to the coastlines um, at certain points in their in their feeding cycles and into seasonality. So they are potentially exposed to some of the these diseases as well from um, from shore based animals too. So always an and a concern. Um, and then finally, for the kind of human cost threats, um, contaminants and pollution. Then we'll get into stranding. Con- contaminants and pollution. Um, so, of course, as one of the larger cetacean species, these guys are at risk of bioaccumulation of toxins. So, again, as we've talked about before, um, these toxins and pollutants can bioaccumulate up the food chain. So you're eating these animals that have eaten small and smaller animals. And basically, every time a larger animal eats them, these toxins get into, you know, get consumed in larger amounts and it gets laid down in the fat stores of the animal. So... Typically, the longer the animal lives and the larger the animal is, the higher the toxicity load can be. So here I'd like to just mention the difference between bioaccumulation and biomagnification because there are two different ones. So the bioaccumulation means that each individual is eating fish and it's adding up inside the individual animal. And then biomagnification means that the the smallest animals down the food chain have a little bit of uh, stuff in them and then the top predators have a whole lot because they're eating all of the things below it so it's magnifying up the food chain and accumulating within an individual so they kind of a double whammy (laughs) they're Mm -hmm. accumulating it and it's magnifying up to their species yeah yeah good different definitions um so i mean the problem with this obviously like i said we've talked about this with other species but basically the problems with this is particularly if the animal is malnourished um you know, these, these toxins very much like they do in humans, they cause issues with immune function, which is a big problem. They can hinder um, reproduction. So they can actually reduce the likelihood of carrying a fetus to term. They can reduce the quality of the milk. They can reduce the animal's ability to successfully reproduce at all. They can lower sperm counts, all of the above. Which is really bad when they already have an interbirth interval of three to six years. Like they're already exactly. not having babies very often and one calf at a time. Like, yeah, that's gonna be right. Exactly. So yeah, if you have these, these animals that do invest everything they have into one offspring if you then lose that offspring that's a huge amount of investment that now you have to repeat um so it can be incredibly damaging especially over the long term um and again like other species the males typically typically have more toxicity than females because they can't shed any toxicity through the young um so it's it it's a pretty big problem yeah i have i have one paper that actually talks about mercury and stuff so oh interesting okay cool and then the conundrum of recent years, which is mass strandings. So again, longfin pilot whales and pilot whales in general are one of the most notorious species to be involved in these mass strandings. And mass strandings, for any of you who are not familiar with that term, are basically, it's a large group of animals, um, typically anywhere from like 10 plus animals, strand at the same time. Um, there. This this year alone, so we're recording this in 2023, um, this year alone there have been multiple mass strandings of longfin pilot whales, um, and a lot of them happening in Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, and I think and, when I hear mass stranding, I just assume it's a, it's a pilot whale species, honestly. It, it's yeah, I right. mean, it's become so common that it's there, that it's them. It's, it's really fascinating. So again, like Cindy said, they think that a lot of the reasoning for that is that that social bonding so if one animal's doing something everybody else is going to you know follow suit and support that animal and do the same thing that they're doing in terms of reasons why they mass strand um, i think the jury is still out on that there are a lot of um, relevant theories and i think a lot of them are probably a combination of these things so uh, a flea response is one if they are fleeing from a predator or from a suspected predator or from a noise that resembles a predator um, is one. Which I'll, I have info on that for the research program. Two, part excellent. Two. Yep. Excellent. Um, things like sonar and, um, you know, marine noise has been 
uh, put forth as a potential reason for this too. A lot of times these strandings do correspond with uh, military action that has been ongoing in the location of the stranding or nearby. And a lot of these sonar sounds, if you've ever heard them, they could potentially resemble a predator sound. So they think that they might be having this kind of very strong flea response away from those things. Um, there are other theories around sort of seismic activity that that could be messing with their internal compass um, yeah. that allows them to find their directionality in the 3D space that is the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, as a terrestrial species, it's kind of hard to comprehend that you can go in literally any direction in your environment because we can't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you have yeah. to have a pretty, yeah, you have to have a pretty good compass to be able to navigate in a 3D environment. And so right. There is some postulation that maybe their um, their navigational ability has become scrambled, and then you know even if not all of the individuals in the group had that same thing happen to them, if they're all following on mass, same thing's going right. to happen. And even if they're not following one individual, they're following the matriarchs or whoever. So if they have right. navigation off, then everybody's doomed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the other you know the other option is that maybe an animal's sick. Mm -hmm. um, or again, like just not doing well. A lot of times cetaceans will come to shallow water when they are not doing well or unfortunately even preparing to die. So there's a lot of different reasons that we can think of that they might be doing this. I don't think we really have landed on one specifically. And as I said, I have a feeling that it's probably more of a combination of, of factors coming together at this critical point. Um, but I mean, these animals have stranded in the hundreds, if not thousands. I don't think we've gone to thousands point yet, but it's been, it's been hundreds and hundreds. It's been close. Like yeah. Animals, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, of course, like there's sometimes we are able to assist these animals and get them back into the water. However, they're so large and they're used to living in a buoyant environment that a lot of times just the weight of being on land will crush internal organs and they can't be saved. Well, and then a lot of times we put them back out to sea and they come right back. Right. Which so has also it's... happened. Yeah. Only so much it's a think. conundrum yeah. yeah and it's it's i mean incredibly distressing to witness it's mm -hmm. um it's not obviously not good for the species but pretty fascinating to me that it's happened so regularly and we still really don't understand why they do this well and that their population is still doing so well given how how slow they reproduce how much we used to kill them how much somewhat we are still killing them and their mass strandings are so large like right which it is it would make like me that should add it up. would make me really interested to actually do like a dedicated population study on these these guys because again we've had instances before where we think the population is doing pretty well but when we actually go out and you know do a dedicated survey to find out we realize that the level is actually way lower than we thought it was so right. who knows yeah interesting. but that's all the depressing stuff i do okay. have some fun facts that we can save for the end of the episode okay. But yeah. there we go. That's all the depressing things I all have for today. <laughs> well, it's very interesting because a lot of this, the, 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 the more recent work that I have here is about um, the response to different anthropogenic and, and predator things. And it kind of goes against some of those theories that we were just talking about. So Ooh, kind of interesting. interesting. Yes. So I'll start off with the one that's odd because uh, just about the, um, uh, the uh, mercury. So this was in, uh, by Bolea Fernandez uh, in 2019 at all. And they used stranded animals uh, and they looked at uh, basically accumulation of mercury because that's a, a very big top um, contaminant that does not really go away. Uh, so they they did see that it, they accumulated mercury as a function of age. So makes sense. They're, they're, they're accumulating uh, bioaccumulation. But what's interesting is the juveniles, the, the mercury in the liver became isotopically lighter. So there was... Um, Isotopes have different number of neutrons in their nucleus, so they weigh differently, uh, but they're the same element. So basically they had lighter versions of that element in the liver mm -hmm. and they re a reduced fraction of methylmercury. Um, and that they found that it, they thought that was because they the, the juveniles preferentially demethylated that methylmercury. And, and then, so you have those lighter uh, mercury isotopes and then they move those to less sensitive organs like the muscles. So they were able to metabolize basically to some degree and shift it out of the liver and put it into the muscles. Um, huh. And then along with that, the changes in diet going from nursing to um, to e eating regular food. So again, females are going to lactate and they're going to dump off that methylmercury and they're going to get it in utero when they're in the, in the uterus and then during lactation. So like the juveniles basically had to figure out a way or the bodies did to get rid of some of that in order to survive. Hmm. Um, so possibly 
you know, they had a detoxification mechanism that they, that was happened um, when they're younger. But what's very interesting is that that trend is completely reversed in when you get older. So the livers had an increasing value of mercury and decreasing amount of mercury in muscles. Interesting. So it's like they could deal with it when they were younger, but then they can't, they can't, that, that mechanism goes away or something. Hmm. So weird. That was quite interesting. Um, and it would be interesting if that is a case, like, oh, they were able to basically figure out a way to, to deal with the extra mercury that you're getting, but at some point your body can't anymore or why that's, yeah. just, I don't know. I wonder if it's just a very costly process to do that. And so over time, your body just deprioritizes it because you're, con- you're not, yeah. you're continuing to, to do, you know, require that same, pro- I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. Fascinating. It's yeah. A st- striking difference. Hmm. Um, so the next couple of papers <clears throat> are about the social, you know, most of this is about the, their social context because that's what's so interesting about these animals. Um, but these two are by Visser et al. Uh, and a, a lot of the papers actually had Visser on it. So I think she's a, a big researcher. She's, in yeah, she's in New Zealand. Um, she's done a, a huge amount of work on the orcas down there as well. Yeah. So they used uh, tag data to, this is looking at the social context of indiv- individual foraging guys. So again, how did, they, it, how did the individual make up that social um, connections uh, during um, foraging dives? They used tagged data. Uh, I think they used D-tags, uh, di- digital acoustic tags, uh, and they matched them with surface observations. So they did this novel protocol, which is kind of cool. They used a dynamic definition of group that was centered around the tagged individual, right? So the definition of oh. what a group is is important to define when you're making this. And they did a, a kind of a unique one, making that tagged individual the center of the group and how that how everybody else reacted. Um, and then they did made a set of behavioral parameters that quantified the visually observable group characteristics. So they mm-hmm. like put them into categories, I think, of like, well, these behaviors means this is happening, these behaviors means this is happening. So very kind of interesting way to look at it. So they what they found was that the tagged individual's dive behavior was linked to distinct group level behavior at the surface. So that during a foraging, <clears throat> during foraging groups, uh, the groups broke up into smaller and more widely spaced units with more milling. So some are foraging, but the other ones just like kind of do, 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 hanging out. Um, then from this data, from being able to, they could feed it into a model and that model could accurately distinguish between bouts of when they're going to do shallow diving versus deep diving based on that group. Hmm. So depending on what the group was doing, they go, oh, they're doing shallow dives right now. Interesting. Which okay. Very cool. Um, and then the members of the group also often synchronize the timing of the foraging bouts. And this was shown by pairs that almost always synchronized when they were going to die. Hmm. So wow. they're like pairing up together <clears throat> and, they, and they will, they will forage um, in groups. They, they, they will, they can do that. Um, but I think with the deeper dives, they don't necessarily do that. I mean, they're probably more in shallow dives depending mm-hmm. what they're feeding at. Um, but interesting if they're still synchronizing and then coordinating that with whatever. So the group knows, oh, those two are going down. Okay, we're going to mill or whatever. And then they're going to come back up and we're going to go, you know, whatever they're doing. They're coordinated. Mm-hmm. Um, so then this one goes, the next one is um, to actually, I'm going to go to the activity budget one since we are talking about, you know, what they're doing during the day. Uh, so this one was by Isajuno et al. 2017. And so an activity budget is basically how much time you spend foraging, socializing, resting, that kind of thing. And they looked at uh, doing naval sonar exposure, uh, killer whale playback, and then negative controls. So kind of seeing what they're doing in response to those. Uh, and then just in general, like what's their general activity budget? Again, using the D tags and that social behavior. So again, Visser was on the study as well. <clears throat> so similar to the one I just talked about. Um, so individuals spent 69% of their time resting or transiting near the surface, 21% on shallow dives less than 40 meters, and only 10% on deep foraging dives. Mm-hmm. And 65% of those dives reached a depth 10 meters from the sea bottom. So wow. they're, they're diving deep, yeah. But it makes sense that they're not going to spend that much time doing that because it's really costly to do so. Right. It's right. Take a lot of energy. So they probably have to spend the rest of that time resting <laughs> to get ready for the next one. Right. Recovery. Yeah. Recovery time. Exactly. Um, the largest individuals are those with cast and more time foraging, which makes sense. The more meat, the more mass you have. And the, if you have a calf, you're going to have to have more energy. 
Um, again, these tagged pairs showed up to 50% of the activity budget was synchronized between <clears throat> the individuals, the conspecifics. <clears throat> but interestingly, decreased synchrony during foraging periods, which is contrary okay. to what the other ones are. Right. I was going to say, yeah, that's the opposite, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they were both done in the same region? I believe so. I okay. don't know how to down there, but I, I think they're in the same region. But hmm. Um, they found less time foraging when in larger non-vocal aggregations in the late afternoon. So apparently that's not a time to forage. It's a time to just hang out with each other. Uh, more time foraging when they were in mid-range water depths. So that must be their preferred 300 to 400 meter. Um, no, that, that's the time you eat because that's the best habitat. Uh, and individuals reduced foraging time by 83% during first exposure to sonar, but not during killer whale playbacks. So they know the oh, difference. Oh. And I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but so I guess the killer whale's like, ah, killer whale's around, we're gonna feed anyway. And maybe diving, actually diving deep probably helps them because the killer whales aren't gonna go mm -hmm. quite as deep. Um, but increased foraging um, was found during repeated sonar. So it seems like they become habituated or they change their response tactic. because like, oh, well, that's, that's not anything scary. So, right, nothing's happening. So I guess I can just keep going on with life. Okay, exactly. interesting. Yeah, so it kind of goes against the that being at least after the first one a reason why they might, you know, strand. So right. it's probably more of a combination of two more things happening at the same time. Yeah. Um. So then on with that, there there were um. The, this is the Visser et al. 2016 study that disturbance specific social responses. So they also did orca playback tagging effort. So pretending they're tagging them, um, and then naval sonar. So all three of them created larger group sizes and increased social cohesion during the disturbance, which makes sense with these social animals, right? They do mm -hmm. everything together, including being scared of whatever's going on. <laughs> so the tagging effort, there was a clear increase in synchrony and tendency to reduce surface logging and, and they became silent. Wow, smart. Right. Smart animals. So they're like, oh, well, we'll just won't stay at the surface as long because you can't get us so much. The sonar, they increased surface rest during sonar, which again huh. is against them being like running away from it. They're just like, oh, we're just gonna stay up here where we're not gonna hear it as bad, maybe. Right, or rest to potentially figure out what our response needs to be. It's almost like kind of pausing and figuring out, okay, is anything coming towards us? Like, let's yeah. all stop and just like, almost like a bit of a freeze, a bit of a freeze response where you're kind of trying to figure out what's actually happening in your environment. Is this thing coming closer? Is I'm right. like Should visually I seeing anything? Use the energy to run away or not. Yeah, okay. interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the killer whales, they increased call rates and aggregation of multiple groups, which approach the sound source together with like a mobbing response. Uh -huh. um, so okay. We talked about this with other animals too. Like it's, you know, some of these, uh, maybe it was false killer whales. I can't remember who we talked about it with, but it was that mobbing behavior towards orcas. Like they're that's the way they're like, well, we're going to survive by just being too many, right? Yeah. Um. So what's interesting is that they were saying that all these responses reduce the risk of loss of group coordination, right? So they're all in different ways creating that group cohesion that these animals are known for and how they survive. Um. So it likely drives the behavioral response, but the behavior behavioral means they use to achieve that coordination depends on and is um, specific to the disturbance that is happening. Mm -hmm. So again, they do, you know, so then it's the idea of like, oh, well, it may sound like a predator, so then they run away. Well, they actually don't run away from predators, at least here. Mm -hmm. So some of this stuff is, is interesting, showing, shedding some light on, on hopefully, hopefully figuring out eventually why these animals are mass stranding. Yeah. Um, Fascinating. Yeah, so then I just have just two more quick ones. Um, this is Zwamborn and Whitehead, uh, 2016. <clears throat> repeated calls and the behavioral context that they're in. So behavior, repeated calls are very common to social animals. Um, and it's, you know, the idea is, okay, well, why is it happening? What is it, what is its function? Um, and so they use a model to look for possible predictors of the presence of these repeated call sequences. So like when they see, see them, what's happening in the groups behaviorally, then can you use that data to say like, oh, this is when this is gonna happen. So <clears throat> it's more common in recordings of socializing whales than other behavioral states and least common in resting mouse. That kind of makes sense. They're talking to each other. Mm -hmm. 
So then um, they were also more common with larger group sizes as well. Again, more people to talk to. Uh, and it suggests that the sequences may function in maintaining contact and cohesion for this very social species, which again makes a lot of sense, and may also serve as individual or group identification, right? So they're like, I'm here, the group is here, this is our group. Um, and it's not primarily for mother calf calls because they've heard them just as commonly when no patch calls. Hmm, okay. So, and it makes sense that they, you know, they're going to have to have some way to keep everybody together. And so, yeah. Like we admit it. That, that happens but i also thought it was interesting because they're the, the common with larger group sizes but then that other study said that the larger groups non-vocalizing larger groups i was, like, I was gonna say that's that's what's really interesting and like the common theme here is that there's a lot of effectively contradictory data yeah which is very interesting yeah it's 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 quite odd um but just beg more questions they're just intriguing little animals yeah. Um, so then the last one is the most recent one I found, um, and this is for the Southern Hemisphere guys. They looked at age, growth, and sexual dimorphism in these animals, and this is the stranded ones from New Zealand from 1948 to 2017. And again, the biological parameters of this population is largely unknown. They found the max age for males was 31, and the max age for females was 38. Um, again, these are in stranded animals, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> but they found uh, evidence for rapid growth in two phases. One, rapid growth and then a second phase of slower growth, and the males having that growth spurt around sexual maturity, which makes sense. Hmm. If they're going to get bigger, that's when they do it. Um, there was very strong evidence for sexual dimorphism with males having significantly being significantly larger in 13 of 14 external measurements. Males have proportionally longer pectoral fins, wider tail flukes, and taller dorsal fins. The estimation of how long they are at birth, the max ages, and the sexual shape dimorphism that they noted in the study differ from those previously reported for the North Atlantic subspecies and may mm. indicate subspecies or population level differences in morphology, longevity, and sociality. So again, are these, should these be com completely different species? Are they subspecies? You know, are they separating more and more now, you know, as time goes? Remains to be seen, but there's evidence of that. Mm. So, wow. um, yeah, so that's what I have for this uh, relatively contradictory highly social, inquisitive, and interesting species. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, OK, well, I just have a couple, uh, actually, just the one fun fact, because I already covered my other two that I had. Okay. Um, so as you guys know, if you are frequent listeners, we like to discuss why they have the names that they have. So we've already talked about why they're called pilot whales, which is their common name. But their Latin name is pretty fun too. So their Latin name is Globicephala mellus. So derived from the Latin globus and the Greek cephalus, meaning globe headed. So again, if you look at a picture, they're big, you know, bulbous head. Mm -hmm. um, mellus is Greek for black. So basically they are black globe heads. <laughs> so there you go. I like it. <laughs> black globe heads. So yeah. And then the other one I had was just explaining the blackfish grouping concept, which we already talked about. So right. Yeah, there I you think go. I, I will leave you with black globe heads. Black globe heads. That is awesome. Um, well, these black globe head animals are very interesting <clears throat> and still so much to learn from them. And I think there is going to be a lot of um, <clears throat> variation in locations, right? And I think we'll find that more and more as we delve deeper into that species. So with that, um, we'll bring you the short wing pilot whale in another episode. Um, remains to be seen whether it'll be next one or maybe we'll let you forget a lot about longfin pilot whales before we dive into short fin pilot whales. But um, I know that one will be fun because there's a lot in Hawaii that they do um, mm. research uh, they do out there, those guys. Uh, so anyway, uh, we will be back next time probably with a journal review. So remember to let us know if you have anything you want us to talk about or a paper that you want us to discuss, let us know in email or on social media. Keep an eye on the Instagram stories next month for your chance to choose uh, who gets the next Marine Mammal Highlight. And as always, be sure to check our website and our um, merch store that has lots of cool stuff that uh, you can get for your friends and family that helps support the research that we do and the podcast that we bring you. So with that, uh, we will see you the next time. Bye. Bye.
This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.